Hello everyone, my name is Jeff Lyle. I'm pastor of New Bridge Church here in Lawrenceville, Georgia, and also the founder of Transforming Truth. I can tell you how blessed I am that you're about to watch a message from Transforming Truth. I believe the message that you're about to hear is going to strengthen you. The Word of God's going to move within you, and you're going to learn something. I hope that every single one that is watching takes what they learn and applies it to their life because that's the way the truth will transform us from who we once were into who God wants us to be. So let's get into the Word of God together right now. Zechariah 4.1, this is the fifth of what will be eight visions or encounters that Zechariah receives, and we're going to talk about this fifth one. The angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. And then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hands of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range to and fro throughout the whole earth. <sighs> Y'all just going to have to let it be messy this morning. I want to talk to you just about a fresh revelation of grace. I don't have anything new to offer you today. I have something that you need that is swirling right now. You weren't born for constant striving. You weren't born into a destiny of anxiety. You weren't, weren't born to wring your hands wondering if you have enough to make it happen, whatever it is. You weren't born to remain in an orphan spirit condition. You weren't born to remain in an arrogant condition where you know you have it all together because you, you know how to hustle. You weren't born for any of that. We were born to live a life in this little vapor, this little mist, this little hundred years at the most, to know him, to learn him by faith, to learn to long for him, to love him whom we have not seen to pursue him, to go after him, to experience him, to be thrilled with him, to enjoy him, to take our deepest pleasures in him. And we're, we're born to do all of that by grace, which means this, he wants that too. That's why he's working on that end on your behalf. He wants you. God wants you. God wants you with all your brokenness, with all your weakness, with all of your myriad of unanswered questions and your impossible quandaries that you find yourself in, with your conflict, with your fears, with your bitterness, with your pain, with your recurring temptations, with your defeatism, the word curses that have been spoken over you, the accusations that still pop into your mind and into your ear. He still wants you. He still loves you. He still thinks you're you're precious. You are his beloved. He's, he has what I would just, I think I can say this reverently. He has a holy infatuation with you that is the purest of love. He's drawn to you and he never stops thinking about you. And get this, it's not because you deserve it. It's not because you've earned it. it it's not because he watched you long enough and finally became impressed. It's none of those things. It's just grace. 
It's just because he wants to. It's just because he chooses to. And he's never done doing that. And what he's doing is he's inviting you to first believe that, to not just sing about it, not just know that we're saved by grace, but to rest in it, to walk in it, to be washed in it over and over as often as you want on the back end of every failure and every collapse and every defeat and every ambush, just to be able to have your instinct shift from, I've got to fix this to, oh, your grace is sufficient. To be able to just live in that place, but we we don't do that easily. And so he constantly shepherds us into it. And he's not frustrated about that. He's not frustrated about saying, I'm going to teach you about grace again because you still don't get it, but I love you and I'm still giving you grace. So Zechariah is a prophet. He's what we call a post-exilic prophet. He's after the exile. He's he's ministering in Judah. The people have been sent back to build the temple. And he is the religious leader along with Joshua, the high priest. You've got Joshua, who's the priest. You've got Zechariah, who's one of the prophets. And you've got this guy named Zerubbabel. Israel doesn't have a king at this time, but they've got a governor. And his name is Zerubbabel. And so in the midst of eight supernatural trance visions and words from the Lord. Uh, We stumble here across number five of these, and it's a word to Zechariah, but it's a word primarily over Zerubbabel. So Zechariah is getting in this moment with the Lord that's a supernatural moment that's being facilitated by an angel. Like, the Bible is, like, really charismatic, by the way. You've got trances, you've got prophets, you've got angels, and you've got visions. And um, I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm kind of like, more, Lord, more, more. And when Zechariah opens this passage, we're going to see that, that he, we, we begin to sense the grace of God in our confusion. And it's because Zechariah is confused about this vision. The first thing that happens is he's awakened. Verse number one says, the angel who talked with me, Zechariah is writing this in the first person, the angel who talked with me came again for the fourth, fifth time, and he woke him up like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. And so Zechariah is in these succession of visions that seem to be connected at times to trances, highly supernatural. Don't try to define it or explain it. Just, just accept it. And, and the angel wakes him up, so he becomes lucid, although he's still in the midst of a vision. He is aware within the vision, and then he is questioned in verse number two. And the angel that comes to him says, Zechariah, tell me what you see. What do you see? So obviously, this question is in the context of a vision opening up to Zechariah. And in verses number two, three, or the end of verse number two and into three and four, Zechariah tells us what he sees. So he's aware of what's going on. He's able to quantify that he's seeing certain things, and I'll read them here in a second. But we're going to find out he has no idea what he's supposed to be gaining or gleaning from all of this. He says, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold. It's got a bowl on the top of it. It's got seven lamps on it and seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right hand and one on the left hand. And then he says to the angel who's talking with him, what is this? What are these, my Lord? So here he is in the will of God in the midst of a vision, a trance that God is giving him, clear communication from heaven. God is saying something. God is doing something. It's unfolding before his eyes. There's an angel who is chaperoning Zechariah through it. And as it's happening, his question is this, what is happening here? And then the angel kind of throws a little sauce on it. And we see that Zechariah is confused in verse number five because the angel just says, you don't know what this is? Do you not know what these are? And you can almost hear it. You can hear the prophet of Israel, the revelatory prophet who's had four previous encounters in this book and he's having this big one that's blowing his mind with a golden lampstand. It's got a massive bowl on the top of it where the oil is. It's got branches coming off the lampstand. Each of one, it's holding its own little lamp. And the oil fuels the fires in the lamp. Then you've got an olive tree here and an olive tree there. And it's in front of Zechariah, and he's supposed to have the answer for it. 
And so he says, I, I, don't, I don't know what, what this is. And he's confused. Why am I telling you any of this? Because friends, I want to tell you the common experience for Christians. We can be in the will of God. We can be seeking the Lord. We can be clear on things that God is doing, but still not understand the why of what he's doing, the how of what he's doing, the when of when it points to, and we can actually be confused about the big picture, even though we see various moving parts about what the Lord is doing. That's happening in some of your lives right now. You sense the Lord is at work, but he's not gone full disclosure with you. You sense him rearranging the pieces of the puzzle, but you have no idea what the completed thing is going to look like. All the pieces are there, but he hasn't put it together. And do you know what sometimes he calls us to do by faith? Sometimes God will dump, let me just use this illustration, he will dump all of the pieces of a puzzle he's putting together. It's about our lives. It's about maybe his glory through our lives. It's about something that we're questioning and seeking him concerning. And he'll dump all the pieces out, and they're all on top of each other. Some of them are flipped upside down, with others have portions of the final picture that are on it, but it looks like a mess, and God says, isn't it beautiful? Isn't this awesome? And I'm thinking, no. No, Jeff, look at this. It's the picture of everything I'm doing. And I'm like, um... The pieces are all flipped over. Some of them, they're, none of them are connected. It's random jigsaw-like. Um, put it together and I'll praise you. And he says, oh no, because I'm building trust in you. I want you to praise me before I put all the pieces together. And that's faith. And I promise you, I know some of you are there right now. You're living in the land of the dumped out jigsaw puzzle. And he's saying, isn't it beautiful? And you're saying, no. And he said, no, it really is. No, Lord, it really isn't. He's like, no, actually it is because it's my puzzle and I'm, I'm giving it to you and it's my gift for you and it's good for you and I want you to trust me more than you trust having all the pieces put together. And that's what some of what Zechariah is going through here. But hallelujah, it's not long before the Lord gives him grace. There's grace in the confusion. Notice what the angel doesn't do. The angel doesn't do what a lot of people in the church might do. Well, how many times, how many visions do you have to have before you start knowing the will of the Father? You still don't know the heart of God yet. You still can't hear the Lord yet. You still don't know what he's communicating yet. Come on, this is the fifth vision. When are you going to get your act together, Zechariah? After all, you're the leader. You're the prophet. You're supposed to be the man of God. Come on, Zechariah. That's what our friendly fundamentalist would say. It's not what Zechariah is told by the angel. There's grace. Why? Because the angel's ministering to Zechariah on behalf of the Lord. And so here comes the grace of God and his plans for us. In the context of a struggle of not knowing what to make of all that we're seeing and all that we're hearing and experiencing in real time, there's grace for that. And as we wait and trust the Lord and acknowledge, we don't fake it. We don't say, oh, yeah, I got this. I know exactly what God's doing. That's a different kind of sham Christianity where everybody pretends like they have all the answers and struggles not allowed to be discussed, confusions not allowed to be discussed, heavy hearts, that's ungodly because after all, you, you fake it till you make it and that's, you know, that's probably somewhere in the Bible, I don't know. <laughs> and not Zechariah, Zechariah's just like, I, I don't know what I'm seeing here, I don't, I don't know what this means. And so look at the tenderness of the Lord and his, his grace and his plans for us. Here's, here's what the vision meant. I mean, no wonder he didn't get it. Here's, here's what the vision meant. This is the word of the Lord. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit says the Lord of hosts. Now, stop there. These are not two random thoughts. The thing that Zechariah was seeing, the lampstand with the big bowl that holds the oil on the top, the illuminated candles, uh, the, the arms of the branches coming off of it, and the two olive trees, here was the interpretation of the vision. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, and I am the Lord of hosts. That's the message. You see, we're about to find out why Zechariah needed the grace of God because he was way over, he and Zerubbabel and Joshua, they were in way over their heads. 
they had been given an assignment that was impossible in human strength. And you go back to this time period, and I want you to know human nature is still now what it was then. We feel like when we get clarity on an assignment, their assignment, by the way, is to go back and rebuild the temple and establish uh, the foundations and build the temple so the glory of God could come back to Jerusalem after 70 years of chastisement and discipline up in Babylon. And so that was their assignment. And when they got there, it was a much more impossible task than they had ever thought. And here's what God wants every leader to know, both then and now, and every believer to know. What I've assigned to you is so significant and so impossible that you can't do it in your collective might. That's a Hebrew word when he says not by might. It's a Hebrew word that typically refers to military might, an amassing of soldiers, a group of people pooling their strength together so they're one big strong entity. He's like, no, that's not going to cut it. It's not your collective strength that's going to get it done. And then you've always got the man or the woman in the crowd saying, they're the Peter, the Lord, all these may deny you, but not me. I uh, need to tell you what I'm made of. And he's like, no, 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 not by your individual power, not by your collective strength, not by your individual power, because I love you, child, but you're really not that awesome. <laughs> Somebody's got to say it. <laughs> he says, no, I don't want you relying solely on one another, and I definitely don't want you relying just on yourself. He says, it's not by might, it's not by power, it is by my spirit. His spirit, especially if we apply it today. God in the earth today is God the spirit. Jesus is seated bodily on a throne in heaven at the right hand of the father. The body that he rose from the grave, he also ascended back to the throne. He is in that body and he's seated in heaven right now. God on earth is the Holy Spirit. God in you is the Holy Spirit. Physically, the Son of God does not live in you. I get it. I don't want to split hairs. But what I, want to, what I want to do is I want to make sure that we understand we need God the Spirit. There's a reason why there is a theological and cultural assault against the person of the Holy Spirit amongst professing believers. And it is because the devil does not, does not ever want us to really get bought into the reality that we have the Spirit, we need the Spirit, we can be filled with the Spirit, we can operate in the Spirit. Because if we dismiss that as just some side doctrine, then all we're left with is our might and our power. And uh, that's not going to get done, what God's assigned the church and our generation. And so... I, I, I just want to leave this with you. I'm going, to, I'm going to move forward. I see the clock. I don't care about it, but I do see it. Um, some of you need to just meditate for 48 hours on this verse until the Lord starts speaking it to you. Um, if your current assignment is not beyond your reasoning through it, is not beyond your resources for it. If your current assignment is not beyond your gifting and strength, then it's likely that current assignment is not the one that God is giving you. God does not give us perpetual assignments that we can pull off without him. And one of the ways that I have known that I have been in the will of God, when I'm, when I'm 100%, assured in my heart that I'm in the will of God with my family, I'm in the will of God with the ministry he's given me, I'm in the will of God with my own stewarding of my own heart. The, the one marker that has been there for 25 years when I'm absolutely convinced that I'm walking in alignment with him is that I know I can't do this life on my own. I can't do it without him. I can't. And it used to bother me when I was a young buck. When I was 26 and I started becoming aware, oh, I can't do this. I was like, yes, I can. Yes, I can. I know I can do this. I'm going to do this. And then you learn over and over as a young person because God's just so patient. He just says like, Jeff, 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 Jeff. No, 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 no. You need to learn what grace really means. I know what grace means, Lord. Saved by grace through faith. I did that already. <laughs> if, if you're in over your head and you're feeling it, it might just be a perfect indicator that God has you exactly where you're supposed to be. If you don't know how it's going to happen, oh, that may be God smiling on it, saying, that's right, 
That's right. That's so good. Yeah, stay there. Stay there. If you're twitching sometimes because you're watching the calendar turn and the, the deadline is coming and you're, 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 you're just not knowing, that, that may, listen, that may actually be an indicator that you're learning to abide in grace because twitching isn't the same as leaping into action. A, a twitch is a leap restrained. <laughs> oh, somebody write that down. I like that. He says, no, it's not, it's not your strength. It's not your power. It is by my spirit. In other words, the Lord is just saying, if I can just kind of convince us, he's saying, hey, it's not you. It's me. But because I love you, it's going to be us. And we tend to think of us, um, me for you, me for you. And God's like, no, actually, it's me for you. And because I'm for you, there's an us possibility. And so if you'll start thinking us, then you won't be relying on your might and your power and you won't be scrambling mentally to figure everything out. You won't be missing sleep at night and you won't be checking the, the stock market every day to make sure you're gonna survive another day. It's just this issue within us that we are, we love to talk about grace, but we are strugglers to be brought to the place where we're actually grace dependent, much less grace comfortable. And so he goes on a little bit further. Are y'all with me? Yeah. Okay. Then the, Lord, the, the, the Lord's word goes from being to Zechariah about Zerubbabel, and then the Lord starts speaking to Zer the thing that is opposing Zerubbabel. God speaks to the opposition here in verse 7. Listen to this. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. So this is not the only time in your Bible where you'll find God, almost it's as if he says, daughter, can you, can you step aside a second? I'm going to speak to that thing that's coming against you. Son, why don't you move out? I'm your daddy. I'm going to move you over right here. I'm going to speak against that thing that's defying you. See, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel hubble double bubble that's, that's quite the name. Big Z, we'll call him that. He was in way over his head, his present mountain. Listen, he's the governor. He's the civic leader of Israel, and he's in an unprecedented situation where he's been given the charge to lead the people back to rebuilding a temple that 70-plus years earlier had been leveled by the enemies of God when, they had turned, when Israel had turned their back on God. So I can't do the full history, but if you read Ezra and if you read Haggai and you read, of course, um, Zechariah, you'll find out that this was a massive undertaking. So Zerubbabel was dealing with the physical rubble that was visible piled on top of each other, the temple that had been destroyed, all the other places that had been destroyed in Israel. He's coming back with a remnant, most of whom had never been there before. The oldest ones among them had been there before, and they're depressed because they're seeing the destruction, and they're struggling with the fact that the new foundation of the new temple is nothing compared to Solomon's temple. And so they're depressed, and they're wailing, and they're crying about it, and Zerubbabel's having to facilitate this project. On top of that, there's fear from the surrounding enemy because the other territories that were pagan were seeing Israel come back. They didn't want Israel to get strong, so they're messing with them. They're threatening them. They're coming up against them. They're calling for legal action and injunctions, not to mention the financial needs to, for the provision to rebuild the temple. The workers, if you look in Ezra 3 and Haggai 2, you find out that the workers that are supposed to steward this project, they're discouraged, they're weary, they're kind of trickling off, and some of them have just abruptly said, I can't do this anymore. Friends, by the way, that's ministry. If you've ever led in ministry, if you've ever led in a kingdom work for God, this is constant. That when the enemy can't go after the leader, the enemy will go after those that are being led to discourage them, to weary them, to get them to trickle off into less things, to explore greener pastures, to, to fail to shore up their commitments in the kingdom. And Zerubbabel's dealing with all of this, and yet God looks at that. And by the way, I think the mountain, when God says, who are you, O great mountain? It's, I, I literally believe it's not just a subjective metaphor for the big problems that Zerubbabel was facing. There's literally a mountain of rubble and rubbish and stones and timbers that have to be completely cleared out before Zerubbabel can even get the foundation for the new temple going. And God just looks at the biggest haunting 
shadowing thing in Zerubbabel's life. And he says, Zerubbabel, hold on a minute. Let me speak to your opposition. And he speaks truth over it. And in, in that, when this message gets delivered to Zerubbabel, there's just something about all of a sudden knowing that God's talking to that thing that opposes you. And sometimes, my friends, he wants to use your voice to talk to it. Sometimes you just got to say into the atmosphere, devil, the Lord rebuke you. Demons of hell, you come at me, you're going to have to come through the blood of Jesus. Come on if you want, but the blood of Jesus Christ be against you. I remind the enemy almost every week that there's an empty tomb that they have to explain. That, that literally, you sometimes you just have to be the voice of God, him speaking through you. So you don't make that mountain bigger than it actually is when God is saying to that mountain, I'm going to level you like a plane. And there's grace for that. Some of you are facing your own mountains. Some of you are looking straight into impossibility. You're saying, I don't know how we're ever going to get this fixed. I don't know how we're ever going to get this done. I don't know how I'm ever going to be the woman I need to be, the man I need to be, the young person I need to be. I don't know how I'm ever going to conquer this besetting sin or this in, in constant struggle. I just don't. And, and the voice of the Lord speaks through the Spirit and says, I say to your mountain, be moved and be leveled in the name of Jesus. And I guess some of it depends on what voice are you listening to? Are you listening to the mountain that opposes you? Are you listening to the God who opposes the mountain? And so Zechariah is getting a message of grace in the midst of God's plans for Zerubbabel. And so I love verse number seven. Zerubbabel shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of, look at me, I did it, I'm awesome. Oh no, that's not what he says. Shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Do you know what God does here? In the vision, and by the way, this is all still an explanation of the candlestick and the olive trees. The message is this, let me just slow down here for a second. The, the candlestick um, that, that Zechariah was seeing it's the light. It's, it's, a, it's an emblem of God's glory. It could even be kind of distilled down to Israel's glory during the season, the returning of the light of Yahweh to that, that region and to that people. And it could, it could refer to the light that will, the glory that will emanate from the temple once it's built. But ultimately, the candlestick is the illumination of the presence and the will and the covenant of God in Israel. And everybody knew in that day, in order to keep the light lit, you got to keep the oil full. And so you got this big basin and oil, but man, somebody's got to make sure that oil gets in there. And God says, mm, no, let me tell you how it's going to work. I got a tree here, and I got a tree here. And later on in the same chapter, you find out that there's two pipes coming from the tree. And the pipes are pouring into the bowl, and God's saying, I'll take care of the oil. I'll take care of the oil. And by the way, later on, you're also going to find out that these two trees represent two individuals. Those individuals are not specifically named. Most people think that it's probably Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest or Zerubbabel and Zechariah. And so it is God's use of flawed people who are limited in understanding and resource and giftedness. God says, that's okay, there's going to be a lot of grace and the oil is going to flow. It's going to be constantly piped. There's going to be enough to keep the lamps burning. And so there we are. And friends, listen, what that does is it speaks to us of a new level of surrender where we're not constantly stressing about, oh, is there enough in me? Is there enough in my ministry? Is there enough in my calling? Is there enough in my family? Is there enough in my Christianity? Is there enough? The answer is no, there's never enough. Your enough is him. Your enough is grace. It doesn't mean we can be flippant and casual and irresponsible. That's not the message. The message is you weren't born to stress over things that you're not empowered to fulfill. And it takes us to abandoning ourselves to grace to where we can still be faithful and industrious and, and committed and joyful without being toilsome and anxious and stressing and fretful and worried. And I, I, this isn't even prophetic. This is just common sense. There's some of you in the room that are living in anxiety and toil and stress, and it's been a long time that you've been that way, and the Lord is still whispering in your ear so tenderly, but he is unbudging on this thing. He's saying, it's still not about you. 
It's still not about your power. It's still not about your gifting. It's still not about what you've built. It's still not about what you envision. It's still not about that. I love you. I'm for you. But it's going to be by my grace. And here's the, here's the kicker. Sometimes we can say no to grace. We say, yeah, I don't know about all that, Jeff. That just sounds like a slacker sermon right there. That's, just, that's empowering people to be flippant and disengaged and kind of casual about their faith. That's not how I'm wired. I, I, I get things done. All right, if you can get things done, somebody else will get them undone. It's just the way it works. So he says to him, Zerubbabel, you're going to, uh, well, look down in, in verse number seven. I already read it. Zerubbabel, let me tell you how this thing's going to end. You're not only going to lay the foundation, but Zerubbabel, you're going to be there. When they put the final capstone in that thing, it's going to be completed. That's what he's saying. He's saying this. Zerubbabel, as you lean into grace, and by the way, for all of us, when we lean into grace, it humbles us. If you don't want to be humble, you're disqualified from grace. You can't cooperate with grace and strut and pride. They just don't go together. It's like walking and laying down at the same time. You just can't do it. Some of you will go home and try, but I'm, I'm telling you, you cannot do it. Leaning into grace will humble you. Leaning into grace will always slow you down. It doesn't mean you'll be on perpetual slow motion, but I'm telling you, when you start leaning into grace, it's going to slow you down because you're going to be thinking about how you're doing what you're doing. You're going to think about how you are being how you are doing what you're doing. But leaning into grace is that very thing that frees you up from striving. I don't want you to raise your hand, but how many of you are living under the presumed pressure that you need to make something happen pretty quick? You don't have to raise your hand. I, I just think most of the time, the vast majority of the time, that's not God speaking, that you gotta make something happen. Leaning into grace secures your dependence upon the Lord. And I will just say that leaning into grace is God's only offer to us. That's his offer. Problem is, is we don't know how. So by the time I'm 30 minutes into this message, it becomes less and less clarified about how we do it. Because again, we want to do something. Oh, okay, I'm supposed to rest in grace. I think I can make that happen. Which is the opposite of grace. And so it leaves us in this place of, well, I'm supposed to rest. How do? And we actually sometimes strive to, to, to be in grace. And this is why I'm saying, yeah, that's why he slows you down. Because you don't get this from a sermon. You don't get it by saying, okay, I validate that this is theologically cr true. It's, it's God's grace and not my striving. Amen, I've got it. No, you don't. You might have the theology of it. But to live it means, guess what? Picking up your cross, dying every day, and following Jesus. In a certain sense, one of the biggest problems with the church is that we're too alive. We're the living sacrifice that has crawled onto the altar, and we keep crawling right back off. And so what he's saying is, I want you to just stay in this place. And so Zerubbabel, just know this, the vision's going to come to pass the project is going to be completed. And Zerubbabel, I want you to know that when it's done, you're going to be crying out, grace, grace. And I'm going to love that because that means I, God, get all the glory. And by the way, if you struggle with God wanting all the glory, um, he's the only being in existence that can say, give me all the glory, and it's perfectly holy. If I say that, watch the lightning strike. If you say that, same thing. But when God says it, everybody ought to say, hallelujah, amen. What, what, what else could we want but for you to get all of the glory? And the only way for him to get all the glory is if we trust in all his grace. Last two verses. The grace of God and his determinations for us. So verses eight and nine. Here comes now this personal promise to Zerubbabel, who's not even in the room, by the way. Zechariah has to steward this prophetic word to take to Zerubbabel. And here it is. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For all of you that are in between, you're not at the beginning yet. 
but the end that you've longed for, that you've envisioned, that you've believed God for, that you've seen in moments of high-pitched faith, you've, 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 it's crystallized, you've seen it, you've tasted it, you've believed it, God has said it, it's cemented in your heart, but it hasn't happened yet. Here's the test. The test is, do you trust that the one who began it will complete it? That it's a test. And this is harder the more you embrace the will of God because his tasks that he assigns to us typically can't be done in the wink of an eye. And so it elongates. And, and the test, part of, the, part of grace is this. Can I trust two years after the promise that the promise is still in play? Can I trust that what I saw when I said my initial yes what I saw then is still going to be what happens. And the only way to rest in that, and by the way, goodness, I've got all these by the ways. Every time I say by the way, it's a rabbit trail, but by the way, there's opposition against the vision he gave you. There's opposition against the assignment he gave you. There is the world, the flesh, and the devil opposing everything he's called you to be. I mean, Listen, I, I, I want to encourage you. Your struggle is real. It's valid because there is a threefold enemy coming against your identity trying to tell you you are something than God, other than what God says you are. And so learning how to go through that, and especially when some of the evidence makes it sound like the accusers got it right. The enemy will tell you the truth about yourself sometimes. He'll just take it to an illegitimate end. The enemy will whisper up and say, oh, man. You are a stinker. You have an attitude problem. This is the same thing you've asked God to forgive you for 45 times last week. And the devil's got the right facts, but he's trying to lead you down the wrong path with those facts because he wants you to conclude, yeah, I ought to quit. I ought to stop. I ought to give up. I, I'm dishonoring God. God's mad at me. He's probably going to kick me out of the house. I'm not going to be able to do this. And what God says is, Oh, mountain, I'm going to level you into a plain. And the work I began with this one, I will see it complete at the very end. And when it's all done, everybody that sees it will know that I was among you. And everybody will say, grace, grace, grace. And so at the end of verse 10, and worship team, if you don't mind, come on up, please. There was a group of people that looked at the smaller foundation of Zerubbabel's temple and they were mourning over the loss of former years. Verse 10 says, whoever despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. What, what is that referring to? There was just a, a, a contingent of older people who were recognizing the Lord was doing a new work but they were, they were entering into death by comparison. Which, by the way, if you live for comparison or in comparison, man, you're drying up on the inside. Things are dying in you. And so they couldn't appreciate what God was doing in the moment because in their estimation, it looked radically paltry compared to what God had done in the past. And what God does is he actually adds a word in the message for those people. And here's, here's the... Here's the the thrust of the message. Don't underestimate small beginnings. Don't, don't refuse to be grateful for smaller gains. Don't compare what you have to what you once had or wh what you hoped you have. Why? Because that's not grace. That's toil, that's striving, that could be arrogance, and that's not the Lord. And what he's saying is this, if you'll rejoice in the day of small beginnings, if you'll just take great comfort in anything you see me doing, they had forgotten they were in captivity for 70 years. It's like, man, when you come out of captivity, the last thing you want to do is get back to the promised land ungrateful. You know, it's just every now and then, just sidebar, sidebar, quick one. Every now and then, when you find yourself getting sour on the terrible, rotten, 
awful hand you've been dealt in life. Maybe just push back from the bitter table and just say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for coming after me with the gospel. Thank you for opening my heart to the word of truth. Thank you for saving me when I cried out to you. Thank you for forgiving me all of my transgressions, rebellions, wrongdoings, and indifferences. Thank you for saying that you loved me even when there were days, months, and years where I didn't give a second thought to you. Thank you for never allowing hell to be my destiny. Thank you for calling my name and having it written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you, Lord, for maybe it's a small beginning compared to what could have been or what once was, but Lord, thank you that I am not where I could be. And thank you, Lord, that I am not here today where I'm going to be eventually. Lord, I believe that your grace is sufficient. Will you, will you stand to your feet this morning?